We need a lot of information as much as we can on the subject of healing, and there are many methods to do that. Your next speaker is practicing in that area in Staten Island, New York, and the, as you can see from the program, her title is in the fifth healing in the fifth dimension or something close to that. She does, she is able to accomplish some rather remarkable results with the methods she uses and she is now ready to explain to you some of the things that she does. So would you welcome Elizabeth Mass, please, of Staten <laughs> Island, New York. Thank you. Mike, would you I'm, like I'm not going to use it. I'm okay. not going to use it. Good morning, everyone. Just let me know if you have trouble hearing me. Okay, I'll speak up a little bit more. Is that better? Good. Good morning. All right. Are we all together yet? It's been quite a few days for those of you who've been here for a few days. How many of you are here just today, have just arrived? Anybody? A few people. Most of you have been taking it in. And I know what happens when you get on overload. Yeah. So I'm going to invite you to join me for a couple of minutes before I start speaking and give you more to process to take a few moments to breathe, to just take a slow, deep breath. And as you exhale, just release everything. Let it all go, whatever you're carrying around, whatever conversation you just had. David Adair is wonderful discussion, just let it flow and be very present. Be very present. I'm going to share with you some of my own experience, my own journey, which is probably your journey too. And I'm going to teach you about some very incredible innovative methods for healing the inner self. My interest in healing has more to do with personhood. Who you are, how you got to be who you are, and what you can do about it. How you can get to be where you want to be. So I'm not so concerned with external devices as I am with the internal self. And to begin, let me uh, share, as I said, some of my journey, which started long ago, over 30 years ago, when I had my spiritual awakening. And in 1967, when I went through a profound existential crisis of despair, does this sound familiar? Yes, I see some of you recognizing that. It led me as it probably has you if you're here today, to this amazing world of spiritual philosophy, metaphysics, all of the understanding, the mystery teachings that we are now very familiar with at that time was very new. You couldn't get a book on this subject in a normal bookstore. You know, I had to hide the things I was reading from the man I was then married to. Uh, no longer married to, and uh, many of those books, you know, it was as if they had to be covered in plain brown wrappers, but not for the usual reasons. So the first seven years after that awakening consisted of absorbing as much information and knowledge as was possible. And then being a teacher, it was natural that I would move from there to teaching what I had learned. So the next seven years was about teaching, was about giving out information, synthesizing all this information and this knowledge. And some of the information that intrigued me the most had to do with cosmic laws. You familiar with that phrase? Cosmic laws. The most commonly known cosmic law. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. We know this is true. We know that what we put out is going to come back to us. Many other variations on that theme. What you dwell upon, you become. What you resist, 
persists, all these neat little sayings that are supposed to help you guide your life and make your life more livable. So I was working really hard studying these principles and working to apply these principles and teaching them to other people. Only something wasn't quite right. Here I was steeped in all of this spiritual teaching and working very hard to apply it all. Only I, like most of the people I was working with, still had fear, insecurity, anger, guilt, self-doubt, still reacted to things, still got hurt. So I'm saying, well, what, what's going on here? I'm meditating every day, I'm praying, I'm doing affirmations, I'm applying all these principles, but something is still not flowing. And I discovered that all of this spirituality doesn't mean anything if you don't do the inner work. You cannot get from here to there by meditating alone. And I'm a great fan of meditation. I've written a book on meditation. I believe it is a powerful tool to balancing, to awakening, to healing, and connecting with the source. But it's not enough. Something has to change. And that's the scary part. We want to get there, but we don't want to change who we are. I work as a spiritual therapist, and most of the people who come sincerely want help. But what they really want is help to stay the way they are, right? Make all this bad stuff go away from my life, but don't touch me. I'm, I mean, I'm okay. It's the world that's not working right. It's this other person who's driving me crazy. We're really afraid of change primarily because we don't understand the nature of change and how change is really not necessarily an abrupt movement where you wake up one day and you're a totally different person. Change is a transformation and it takes place in a process. And it can be very exciting, it can be very enlightening, very enriching, very empowering. In fact, that's the only way to get there, is to do the inner work that enables you to awaken to who you really are. So now here I am, working with people, teaching groups, guiding people through meditation, assisting them in understanding spiritual principles, and now people are starting to come to me for private sessions. And it became very clear, very quickly, that I had to do a crash course in psychology. Because you can't start opening up without dealing with the things that start to come up. And that's the beginning of a whole new journey. That's the beginning of discovering how we get to be this person. This person that you are, that calls yourself by your name, this identity that you have established, that you're working very hard to preserve, is not who you really are. It's a cover-up, in fact. It's a cover-up. And the cover-up started, for some people, it started at birth. For some people it starts, for most people, it starts within the first three years of being here in this world. Some people bring it in from the womb, womb experiences, intrauterine experiences, sensing what the mother is feeling. Of course, we bring in a whole soul history of past lives. But we don't even need to look at that, although I do look at those past lives, and they are often very relevant to what's going on now. But the truth is, you can, you, this life is enough. This life contains everything from your past. So I started learning more about and exploring with people the forces at work very early in life 
that contributed to what I see as the shutdown of the original self. Something in us, the minute we experience a lack of love, a lack of attention, a sense of neglect, some emotional quality in the environment in which we are lying in our crib or cradle, something that's going on around us that's frightening or that creates a vibration that is harsh for our sensitivity, causes us to pull back, to withdraw our energy, and to shut it down because it's too scary, it's too painful, and we need to protect ourselves. The minute we go into self-protection, we lose a portion of who we really are. And this is where all of the spiritual teachings now begin to make some sense. In A Course in Miracles, one of the primary lessons is, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. That's a paradox. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. The minute I need to defend myself and protect myself, I now exacerbate the problem. I increase my fear. I add to my need to protect myself. It becomes a vicious cycle. It's only in my defenselessness, in my utter vulnerability, in my openness, that nothing can hurt me. Because that openness requires that I know that nothing can hurt me. But when you're three days old or three years old, you don't know that. You don't know that. So you need to protect yourself. And from the means that we choose to protect ourselves, and we all have unique and very interesting ways of developing our forms of protection, the minute we do that, we develop what we now know as our personality, our personality self. So some people are outgoing, and some people are quiet and withdrawn, and some people are demanding, and some people are passive, and we all have our personality. But that's not who you really are. There's a wonderful book that I came across very early in my spiritual studies, and it, some of you may be familiar with it. In fact, I even saw, thought I saw a copy of it in the bookstore called The Impersonal Life. The Impersonal Life. And the message is that we must evolve beyond personality, beyond our ego investment in self, to impersonality. We must evolve beyond identifying ourselves as male or female, as American or some other nationality, as a particular relig religion, a particular race. We must go beyond those identifications to our impersonal, universal, spiritual, true self. And that's what we're in the process of doing and it is in the process of working with people to assist that evolution and working, I must say, very hard on myself, I have come to learn and develop many interesting tools and techniques to assist that process. I've always needed to make it practical. If it doesn't work and serve a useful purpose, it's just intellectual and interesting, but it's not helping. So, as I started to work with people, the first methods that I began to work with were de derived from meditation. Meditation was my mm, field of expertise, you might say. And in the meditative state, which I, I soon learned is very similar to the hypnotic state, there's a very fine line between the two, you can begin to do things within the inner self and make changes at a very profound level. Because that meditative state, that altered state of consciousness helps you to correct, connect 
directly with those energy forces which were imprinted, implanted, and programmed very early in life and are now unconscious. So what you can do is you can contact that which is buried within and you can bring it forth, you can look at it, you can release a lot of those energy blocks and you can free yourself. And one of the methods that I used was guided imagery. Now guided imagery is very commonly spoken of now. You can get books on the subject. When I first started doing this, I was experimenting. I was one of those pioneers who made it up as I went along and searched for other people who knew what I was doing, finally found that there were, there were some people who were developing very powerful techniques in the use of guided imagery for healing, mostly for healing physical conditions. You're familiar with it perhaps in terms of Simonton's work with cancer patients. And I started applying those principles to psychological states and emotional conditions. So I developed some very interesting imagery techniques, which were not just about imagining, making believe, make believe you're walking down a street and you find a bag of money and now you're rich and wealthy and so you can generate income. No. This is about getting in touch with the feeling level, the beneath emotion even. When I say feeling, I mean what you really sense, what you know in your bones, that level of being and actually making changes there, doing things at that level. I have a technique that I use that I'm going to teach. I'm doing a number of workshops here. I'll tell you more about them. On Tuesday, I'm doing an all-day seminar. And we're going to be using some of these imagery techniques in that seminar. One of them is called the machinery of the mind. The machinery of the mind, which involves envisioning. And even if you can't visualize, by the way, which I don't, you can be guided to do this work. So don't worry if you think you can't visualize. All you need to do is imagine. And this particular technique starts with focusing on something that's bothering you, something that's feeling like a block in you. Sometimes it's um, a reaction. Every time I have to get up to speak, I get nervous, OK? So suppose that's your deal. You get nervous when you have to speak. So I will have you focus on that sensation of nervousness. What does it feel like in your body? In your body. And sometimes it's a tightness in your stomach, or it's a buzziness, or you get shaky, or whatever it is. And as you focus on that sensation, I would ask you to imagine that that sensation has a color, and that it is a substance and that this substance is being manufactured and produced by some kind of a machine. Maybe it's even a pot of boiling stuff that's being cooked up. Or maybe it's this um, generator that's spewing out this electrical energy. Whatever comes to mind, whatever you imagine. And working with the machine, we unplug it, we take it apart, we dismantle it, we throw it in the, in the um, incinerator. We do all kinds of things with that machine. Sometimes there's a person running the machine. We have to deal with that person, too. We have them retire, go take a vacation. We do all kinds of things with this image. And, it, and it's amazing because it's really having a profound effect on your inner self and your subconscious mind. Then we replace the machine with a new, updated, high-tech model that's going to generate the quality of energy that will give you a sense of peace. Now, this is all taking place in your imagination, quote unquote. But it's really taking place on this innermost level, and it has profound effects. So I was doing this kind of thing with people. I developed a technique called cutting the cord, which again, focusing on a sensation, an issue, a problem, uh, and following a cord of that energy to the origins of that problem. The origins of the problem invariably are very early in life. And what's interesting with these techniques is that your inner self knows. Every cell of your body knows. You don't have to know it consciously. Most of us aren't even aware of the things that affected us when we were children and how they continue to affect us. I had a client recently who discovered 
that all of her feelings of low self-esteem that prevent her from having a healthy relationship with a man now that she's 42 started when she was six years old which we discovered by following the cord of energy. And she's standing in her backyard, and there are other children playing. And one little boy who was older than she told her that she didn't know what she was doing, and she was stupid. Well, some people might not be affected by that. But she was. For her, it literally traumatized her. It caused her to feel alienated from others. It caused her to feel she didn't belong. She heard those words, and she, her whole energy sucked in. Now, in the process, she was reliving that. And as her energy withdrew, from that point on, she never had sufficient energy to be who she really was to be comfortable with people. This is the kind of work that started to develop. And the more we went into those experiences and did the releasing and the healing and letting it go and transforming the energy system, new energy starts to emerge. You start to wake up. You start to breathe more deeply. You feel more alive. You become more centered. You're more whole. Amazing things start to happen. I was excited. I was not even a trained psychotherapist. And I was doing these extraordinary things. Well, I had to go get some training, let me tell you, real fast. And I had to read a tremendous number of books. When I did the training program that I did, I was, I guess my ego was delighted to discover that I seemed to know more than the other people in the training program who were coming through the academic world and learning psychology from textbooks. I was having these experiences with people, and I discovered that it was my gift that I knew intuitively. And moreover, eventually I had to come to terms with the fact that I was being guided. And I say I had to come to terms with that fact because up to this point I had been reading a lot of books and meeting other people who were phenomenally psychic and intuitive and everything and healers, but it never, I never thought it applied to me. Perhaps some of you are familiar with that feeling. But what I discovered was, as long as I trusted and stopped shutting down what I was sensing, experiencing, knowing, and feeling, and allowed it to work through me, miracles happened. And I knew it was through me. And not of me, because I was still stuck in my own personal stuff. And I still had to work through a lot of that. You know, this is, this is the truth. <laughs> confirmation there. The baby in us keeps crying out for help, for attention, for recognition, for acceptance. And we need to get in touch with that baby in ourselves and love that child. We were all taught to love ourselves. But most of us are so busy condemning ourselves and judging ourselves that we have a real hard time loving the person we think we are. So what we really need to love is the baby, the child, who's innocent and sweet and open and curious and full of life. That part of ourselves still lives. And the more you get in touch with that part of yourself, the more that baby begins to feel secure and confident and loved and can begin to emerge. So, everybody breathe. I feel this. Breathe. <laughs> oh, okay. So I was going merrily along, doing this work, very content. But I'm never allowed to stay content for too long. I was, this morning at about 3 in the morning, I was looking at how my life had evolved in, in segments of, in seven-year segments. Not a surprise, I guess, if you're aware of numerology. So, the next seven-year segment consisted of my opening up another dimension of my own abilities. I opened a holistic center, and I was its director, administrator, chief teacher, and organizer, and brought in lots of other teachers to do workshops and programs. And I wrote the brochure, and I was writing articles that were getting published, and I was involved in the organizational aspects of my my being, I guess my left brain had gotten a little jealous. I was doing all this right brain stuff. 
So for a number of years, I was involved in that until I got a little burned out. I knew something was wrong. The day I ran out of a therapy session, had to get to the phone to talk to the printer about prices for printing a brochure, and my assistant needed some help, and somebody else wanted to buy a book. And then I had to run inside and teach a class in stress management. Something is wrong with this picture. So it became, I became more and more aware that I was experiencing the symptoms of severe stress. And eventually, I had to close the center. And after I closed the center, now this was 1995, everything seemed to stop. Everything seemed to slow down. And I sat around saying, what am I supposed to do now? Well, I had to heal myself. I had to take care of nurturing me. I had to slow down. I had to start walking in the park. I had to discover what it was like not to have a caseload of clients and a waiting list. And in fact, my clientele seemed to disappear. I said, what's going on here? What's going on? Well, a couple of things were going on. And one of them started, I didn't realize until later, when I had asked, I had asked my guides for a way to help people that would be faster and easier. Because I knew that the work that I was doing with people, which was taking weeks and months and sometimes even years, we didn't have time for anymore. I knew that we, we're in the process of speeding up our evolution. And we, as a, as, a re as a species, were ascending. Now, I have to postpone my story for a second and talk to you a little bit about ascension. I think most of us first encountered this concept through uh, the story of Jesus after his crucifixion, when we read that he after three days, he arose, and then eventually he ascended. He ascended. His physical form was transformed into energy. And he no longer operated at the physical level. Sometime in the, in the early part of this decade, maybe 91, 92, we started hearing more and more about ascension. Books started coming out. Methods were developed. I was trained in a particular technique, presumably derived directly from Archangel Michael, to assist people in facilitating their ascension process. We are expanding our consciousness. We are evolving. This conference is a symptom of that, a symptom, a sign. Symptom is not the right word. Our interest in these subjects, the tremendous awakening that's taking place on the planet, is indicative of the fact that something is shifting in human consciousness. Now, this shift is having very interesting effects. It has physical effects. How many of you are having trouble with your memory? <laughs> How many? Can you remember what you saw and heard 10 minutes ago? How many walk out of a room, walk into the next room, and what did I come in here for? No, it is not early Alzheimer's. Brain waves are changing. The nervous system is changing. How many of you hear strange sounds in your head? Buzzing noises, high tones. Anybody hear these high-pitched tones? I went through an experience long before I knew anything about this. It had to be 20 years ago. When I would pass through a traffic signal, the changer, you know, changes the lights, and I would hear this piercing sound in my head. 
took me months before I could absorb that high frequency of energy. Our frequencies are changing right down to the cellular level, right down to the molecular level, right down to the DNA. We are changing. And a lot of physical things are happening to us, increased sensitivities to chemical conditions, toxic, tox toxic conditions, dyslexia of the mouth as well. All kinds of things are happening. And they're also affecting us on mental and emotional levels. For one thing, we're having a lot of difficulty tolerating loud noises, violent images, right? Harsh energies. We can't take it. We are becoming very sensitive. We are transforming. We are becoming more and more light. And we need to be able to hold this higher degree of frequency within our bodies and within our emotional bodies. Now we get back to the point of how we use this information to help people and why it is so important to speed up the process. We don't have much time anymore. We've got to clear out the dysfunction that we inherited from our families. We've got to cleanse the belief systems that keep us stuck. We have to awaken our true spiritual selves. And I said, this is all very well and good. I want to do this work, but we've got to do it faster. We've got to do it easier. We've got to do it in such a way that I don't burn out. And here I was in this hiatus, and after I'd done enough resting, I was presented with the next level of therapeutic modality to assist people in rapid change. I want to tell you about these things. Brain gym, thought field therapy, tapas acupressure technique, EMDR, any of you heard of EMDR? Eye movement rapid, rapid eye, eye movement rapid desensi desensitization, desensitization response. I'm not saying it right. Okay, a number of these techniques are based on the fact that we are an energy system and that we have lines, meridians of energy that run through our being and that interconnect the physical with the etheric body, with the astral, emotional bodies, and the spiritual body. And by accessing those meridians in a specific way, we can undo psychological blocks. We can release a lot of the stuff that has been holding us back very simply and very easily. It's very exciting work. Brain Gym is a system that was developed by Paul Dennison to improve brain function for ease of learning. And I'm going to give you one simple little exercise to do right now. It's a series of exercises that you can do. If you just start at the top of your ears and kind of massage the edges of your ears from the top down to the bottom and really pinch and stimulate all the way down and see how that feels. What does it feel like? You notice anything happening? Anybody? My ears hurt. Your ears hurt. <laughs> Don't rub that hard. <laughs> when you do this, it wakes up your ability to listen, to hear, to process information, and to be alert. Interesting. There are a number of very simple exercises like that that you can learn. And I will be teaching them in the workshop that I'll be doing here on energy therapies. The next technique that I learned about was thought field therapy. Thought field therapy was designed by um, Roger Callahan, who was a psychologist. And he used a system to determine specific points on the body which connect with acupressure, acupuncture points, 
And by tapping those points in particular sequences, you could release a phobia in five minutes. You could undo anxiety, fears, and trauma imprints very quickly. There were a great many things that could be released through this method. You could also use the method to create the, uh, to generate the ability to manifest what you want to manifest by tapping certain points. Collarbone, under your arm, under your eye. And amazing things happen. The only requirement is that you come with your problem. If you have access to the fear, if you can remember the, the trauma, if you can feel the anxiety, you can release it very rapidly and without necessarily getting into the details. That the therapist doesn't even have to hear your story, although I like to take time to have that connection with people. But the truth is, all you need to do is connect with it and tap these points and in a matter of, of, of half an hour or an hour, you can release something that's been bothering you for 15 years. I watched a demonstration with a woman who'd had a, a phobia, a fear of elevators, all her life, could not get on an elevator. This is a problem if you have to be somewhere on the 20th floor. This technique was done with her, and five minutes later, she went up and down the elevator. What's going on here? I've come to conclude that the necessity has allowed us to receive this information. So thought field therapy, tapas acupressure technique was developed by Tapas Fleming, an acupuncturist, who discovered a set of points on the head. I'll show them to you. The, the ring finger and the thumb between, right at the corners of the eyes, the, third, the middle finger at the third eye center, and the other hand at the lower back of the head. And this particular position, when you are guided appropriately, first just doing this alone will help you to release stress. But doing this process, she has a, it's a four-step process, you bring up the issue, you begin to get amazing insights as to what it's really all about. And you can release the origins of the problem and where it is stored in your physical body. Very interesting work. EMDR is a system that has been extremely effective in releasing the problems of post-traumatic stress syndrome by eye movements alone. Eye movements are very key here because we're discovering that the optic nerve connects with the brain in a certain way that will undo the blocks and open the brain to process information differently. This is amazing stuff. And what's really exciting is that you can learn a lot of these techniques and use them for yourself. We need tools we can use. We need to stop relying on other people, other devices, other machines, other things, because we need to be able to do it for ourselves and to help our friends and neighbors with it. In the workshop that I'll be doing, I'm doing two things. One is the, th the three-hour workshop, which is thus far scheduled for Monday morning. I will be giving you this information. I will be teaching it to you. I have a whole booklet of, hand of information that you will receive. You can take it home and you can start doing this for yourself. You can alleviate a lot of the problems that have been plaguing you. It's time to clean it up and get on with it. It's time to open up to what's out there for us. Now, I want to demonstrate something with you. How many of you are familiar with kinesiology, muscle testing? Some of you. How many of you have never heard of it, don't know anything about it? Okay, a few. Most of you are familiar with it. I'd like to demonstrate it even though you are familiar with it because for those of you who are not, this is the most groundbreaking method of accessing our inner wisdom. And it is the basis for all of these energy therapies. They were all developed by people 
who used muscle testing to determine what is needed by the body at that time, but not only for the physical body, for the psychological, emotional body. So if somebody would be interested enough to come up and be a quick subject for me. Any volunteers? Quick demonstration of muscle testing. Oh, don't jump up all at once. Somebody who's never experienced it. Who's never experienced muscle testing? I would really like that. You don't know anything about it. OK, can you come up here? Thank you. What is your name? Peggy. Peggy. OK, Peggy. You can, you can actually yeah, sit. Why not? OK. All right, Peggy. This is a system of accessing the wisdom of your body through your muscles. And we're going to use the muscle of your arm but in just a moment. The theory is this. Our inner self knows when we are in the presence of something that is detrimental to us or when we're in the presence of something that enhances us, whether it's a thought, a substance, another person, a condition of any kind. When we are in the presence of something that does not serve us, every part of our energy begins to weaken. And we, demonst we can see this through the muscles most clearly. When we're in the presence of something that's life enhancing, that's good for us, it strengthens us. Okay, that's the idea. So we're going to use your arm just to demonstrate how this works. So if you'll hold out your arm, I think you need to take off that watch though. Do you have any problem with this arm at all? No, it's just my back there. Is this arm a little bit better, that side? Yeah. Okay, well then, all right, then leave your, leave your watch and I'll just use this side, okay? I have this tail behind me. It's a little strange walking around with this. Okay, so I, what I'd like you to do is, can you all see her? You know, it, would you mind standing? No, this is fine. Well, I, I think it might be easier for them to see you. Okay? Okay. Is that better? Okay, so turn sideways. Okay. So I'm going to ask you, when I push down on your wrist, I want you to resist me and push up to the ceiling. Okay? Resist? Good. Now I'd like you to say the word yes. Say it loud. Yes. Okay, now resist again. Hold, resist me when I push you. Push up to the ceiling. Good. Now say the word no. no. And push up to the ceiling. Uh, push up to the ceiling. Push up as hard as you can. Push up, push up, push up. Okay. Do you see what happened when you tried to resist me? You couldn't. Let's try it again. Say, my name is Peggy. And push up to the ceiling. Push up, push up. Good. Now say, my name is Susan. And push up again as hard as you can. Resist me. Resist. Push up. Push up. Okay. If you cannot resist when you're saying something that isn't true. When you're in the presence of something that is not for your best interest, the muscles will weaken. We'll use one more quick little demonstration of this because it's a favorite of mine. I want you to see my faces. Do you all, can you all see that? Okay, I'm going to show this to, uh, to Peggy. Can you see this face? I want you to get a good look at it. Okay. Get a good look at that face. Um, crossing in front of you, sorry. Okay, and you see that? <laughs> okay, hold your arm up and resist as strongly as you can. And she can't resist, but we're not going to leave her there. What we're going to do is look at our ever famous happy face, the smiley face, and see what happens this time. Oops, sorry. Okay, get a good look at that face. In fact, could, yeah, could you hold that like that? Okay, you look at that and resist me as strongly as you can. And I can't push you down as hard as I try. Because that which is positive in life enhancing strengthens you. Now, this is something to really think about. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate your being here. Thank you. Can I help you down? No, that's okay. Okay, thank you. So you can see how our bodies respond. This work can help us access everything we need to know for our own well-being because it's all within us. When you do the three-hour workshop with me, I'm going to teach you a self-testing method that you can use for yourself to determine what's, what nutrients are good for you, what decisions are best for you and will serve you. There are amazing things that you can do with that. So I was very excited about learning these techniques because they were helping people tremendously. I've seen 
results, issues clear up rapidly, fears dissolve very quickly. And that one, by the way, is the key to everything. You know that fear is what blocks us. So when you can release that, you are open. You're open to the light. You can evolve yourself and you can hold higher frequencies of energy. Now, along with all of these techniques, there was another facet of learning that I, I had to explore. I say had to because I was led into it. I, it was given to me. And that is something very interesting. That's the work with a pendulum, dowsing. But not dowsing for substances. I call it pendulum healing work. And it has opened up a whole other area of work that I can do with people. It enables me to work on the telephone, because if I can't muscle test somebody, I can use my pendulum to determine what is needed by that person. I have a whole chart of all the various modalities that I work with, and I can use my pendulum, and my guides will work through me and direct the energies of the pendulum so that I get all the information I need. I don't really need it, but I like it. It's really a fun tool to work with. And it has enabled me to do some amazing things like release entities, release implants. And this one, which was given to me at the last Global Sciences Conference in Daytona Beach, Florida. It was quite an initiation for me. I, I like to say I, I lost my political virginity at that conference. There, it was. It was pretty mind-blowing. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that I knew that I really didn't want to know that I was being forced to know. And I had to know it in order to be of help. I had to understand what's really going on in terms of mind control in order to undo it. And that was given to me at that time. Using the pendulum as a tool which enables me to access my team of guides and angels who do the work. I serve as an anchor. I serve as a spiritual focal point, And they do the work. I was given the ability to release mind control programs that had been placed in many, many people at that conference. And some of you Many of us, without knowing it, without realizing it, have been exposed to people who have had less than our best interests at heart, who were seeking to manipulate and control. And they do it, and it doesn't have to be a physical chip that they put in you. They know how to zap you in your weak spot. They know how to weaken your energy field, and they know how to get in there and implant thoughts and ideas which are not in your best interest. I was gratefully given the ability to help with that. I will be available for private sessions here with people who feel they would like to do that kind of work. If you're interested in the energy therapy work, come to the workshop. If you're interested in the deeper level of work, I'm doing an all-day seminar on Tuesday. And there we're going to get into the issues that we're going to get into helping you see the origins of the issues and release and clear them and move into forgiveness and peace. I use a lot of music, I use chanting, I use sound vibration. Uh, a lot of uh, loving energy comes through when I work. I, I'm surrounded by great beings. And it's a beautiful experience. So if you want to take advantage of this opportunity to do your inner healing this weekend, if you're thinking of leaving before Tuesday, don't. Stay. Hang in there and do this work. It's a great opportunity for you. So I'll be doing private sessions. I'll be doing a workshop on the energy therapies. I'll be doing the intensive inner journeys, it's called. And there's literature. I have flyers out about these things. My table is table 44. I also have meditation tapes and things like that that have been infused with great spiritual energy. So you can come back to my table and you can look at the things I have there. Now, I'd like to give you an opportunity to ask some questions and to bring this to a close. So if you have questions, please go over to is the mic microphone and uh, anything at all on what I've said or comments or whatever, OK? Yes. Just out of interest, um, 
How many silver mercury fillings do you have in your teeth? Aha! There's the silver mercury guy. Well, actually, uh, fewer than I used to <laughs> because I've had some uh, crowns done on my teeth. And you used to have quite a few? I used to, yeah. yeah. How many do you have now? I, I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. Is okay, there, thank you. What, what, what's the purpose for your question? You want to know why? Yeah. Well, uh, through Dr. Huggins' research, and uh, who's a pioneer in the, the illnesses and, and, and um, gifts, so to speak, that can be affected and caused by uh, mercury. Um, the mercury, well, oh, excuse in dentistry, me. pardon me, go uh, ahead. I'm sorry, I, I'm going to interrupt you because I think we're aware of the dangers okay. of mercury. I okay. was curious to know why you were asking the question of, of me in particular. Well, so far, in my polls that I've taken, 100% of the psychics that I have met and known uh, have mercury fillings. Oh. And they have mercury in their brains okay. that leaks out of their fillings. Oh. And it changes how their brain function works. Uh huh. And they are the survivors where there's probably a thousand for each <laughs> one of the psyches that survives and has a gift. There's that many that die of, of mm. malfunctions. Uh huh. But they are the survivors in it's our very society. Very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Is there another question? There sure is, yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, do, you, do you use your abilities with muscle testing and or dowsing to figure out exactly what is the problem that this person is coming to you with or to peel the layers of the onion to find out virtually everyone who I have seen comes in and gives me this is the problem mm -hmm. and I say sure. <laughs> and then we dig, and, and then they say, well, that's the problem. And I say, yeah, right. And then we dig, and we get to another layer. And finally, their eyes open, and they say, oh, do you really want to work here? Yeah. And I say, yes. yes. And my partner has used, in the last little while, muscle testing to knife through all the layers mm -hmm. to the very lowest level that the person is ready to deal with that particular day. Yes. Do you use that technique? Yes, at? I do. I certainly do. Um, the muscle testing is a wonderful gauge of what's truly going on. And um, in the way that I work, there seems to be a very uh, interesting ability to get to the core issue very quickly with people. Sometimes I can use the pendulum to get answers, but I prefer not to. In fact, it's interesting. For a while, I was really upset that I didn't have this phenomenal clairvoyance that other people seem to have and see into the body and see into the soul and read the whole soul's history. And why, why, why didn't I have this wonderful ability? And eventually, I came to understand that some part of me had chosen to keep that closed in order to facilitate your ability to find out rather than have me tell you what I see. What I do is guide you to the deeper levels of your own knowing and help you to see it for yourself. So that's been wonderful for me. I would like to mention one other thing. I know there's another question, but there's another technique that was developed by Roger Callahan in conjunction with thought field therapy, which has the ability to undo subconscious self-sabotage. Do you know what that means? That means that you can want something really badly with every part of your consciousness, but some little tiny part of you inside won't let you have it. Does that sound familiar? Oh, yes, I deserve this. I can affirm this. I want this. Why can't I get it? There's another part of you that's in opposition. It's not necessarily the enemy, by the way. It can be. It, it believes it's being your friend. So there are a number of techniques I've developed to help clear that. But Callahan has this rubbing, <laughs> rubbing this spot. I'll show you what it is. It's on the left side of your chest. I'll give you a freebie real fast. On the left side of your chest, if you feel around for a sore spot, it's like if you were going to salute the flag and then just bring your fingers in. If you feel around, you'll find a sore spot there, and you rub that spot very, very deeply. And you repeat three times out loud, I deeply and profoundly accept myself. Say that. I deeply and profoundly accept myself with all my problems and limitations. OK, that's what you would say. And it's amazing when you do that. You do that a few times a day. 
and it really begins to help you get clear and centered. It aligns you. It aligns you. Question. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, how does one, well, I'll put it this way. When I've, I've used the pendulum, um, and also with, the, with, the, uh, with my fingers, and I find a hard time in keeping out of the way. When I ask a question, I most of the time have to ask, have I influenced this? And I get a yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it's, that's a, a whole other study is the art of the pendulum. And I, I, I've been teaching a, an introduction to pendulum dowsing. One of the things you do have to be very aware of is how easy it is for you to influence and interfere with the process. That's true with muscle testing, by the way, also. That in order to get accurate answers with muscle testing, you have to first be balanced in a certain way. One of the ways to do that is to tap in or to tap the thymus but there, or drink water. There are things you need to do to kind of bring yourself to sufficient balance so that you're not going to interfere. But in my work, I sometimes find I can sense when I have a little hidden agenda, if, especially if I'm asking for myself. I mean, you know, when I, I know what I want the answer to be. You have to be real careful with that. And so I've learned to ask, is there anything within me that is influencing this answer? And that usually gives me what I need to know. Can we take one more quick question or no? OK, I want to thank Hello, I have one. Oh, uh, Dean says no. No. Can I announce oh. the meditation, however, at 1.30? All right. Yes, at 1.30, Dean has kindly given permission. Today is a day of global peace meditation. I welcome you, invite you to be here. I'm going to join with those of you who want to come and lead a special global meditation from 1.30 to 2.00. And we're going to move the program back 15 minutes. And I really want to thank Dean for doing that. So be here at 1.30, OK? Thank you. thank you all very much. That, uh, in connection with that mercury filling question and that subject, Tom Ellis is a dentist from uh, Wichita, Kansas, and called me Wednesday just before we left for, for the hotel saying he couldn't be here. His heart is fibrillating. He's having a lot of heart fibrillation problems. And they tell him it's because of mercury that he has been putting. As he put it, all this mercury crap I've been putting in people's teeth for all these years has now got to him. Uh -huh. And so he, uh, mm. he's having to take it easy because of his heart problems, which have been related to the mercury filling problem Could situation. Could you grab this wire for me? Uh, all right, now we want to get back here as quickly as we can because we have three people to share the next hour or the next presentation for you, and they have an awful lot to present. So I'm going to blow the whistle in five minutes. So do whatever you got to do, if you got to do it, and be back quickly, stretch, or whatever you need to do.